Welcome to episode two of the Lightning Network mini-series. In episode one, we cover topics like on-chain scaling and why we need the Lightning Network. In this episode, we're going to be diving into what the Lightning Network is, how it works, payment channels, routed payment channels, onion routing, centralization risk, and limitations. So we've got a lot of great content. But before we get started, let's first establish some background information. So the Lightning Network is what's called a second layer solution, meaning it runs on top of a pre-existing blockchain and allows the users of that blockchain to send transactions in a near instant manner with very low confirmation fees and while storing a minimal amount of data on the blockchain itself. So it's a scaling solution and it employs smart contracts to keep this process entirely trustless. So a common source of confusion about the Lightning Network is whether it's a project, a protocol, or a company. So let's break that down. The Lightning Network is a protocol. Like any protocol, it can have multiple implementations. This just means that there may be multiple code bases written in different programming languages that all implement the same Lightning Network. To make sure that these implementations are compatible with one another, they all must adhere to a common protocol specification called BOLT, which stands for Basics of Lightning Network Technology. The BOLT specification describes, in English, how the various features and functionality of the Lightning Network should work. Developers will then take those written descriptions and turn them into code. Different development teams will use different programming languages, thus creating the different implementations. But as long as everyone adheres to those Bolt standards, the different implementations will be compatible with one another. So these various implementations are all open source projects, which means that anybody can contribute to them, but there are centralized companies that are leading the charge in contributing most of the development work to certain implementations. You know, for example, the company Lightning Labs is the main development team behind the Bitcoin Lightning Network implementation written in Golang. The company Blockstream is the main development team behind the Bitcoin Lightning Network implementation written in C. So different cryptocurrencies will also need their own implementations. You know, Decred is creating a Decred Lightning Network implementation written in Golang. So instead of having to start from scratch though, the Decred developers are using the code from the Bitcoin Golang Lightning Network implementation and then tailoring it to work with Decred. So again, as long as those Bolt specifications are adhered to, the Decred Lightning Network and the Bitcoin Lightning Network will be compatible in the future. So we'll dive more into what this means for cross-chain atomic swaps in episode three. All right, let's dive into how the Lightning Network actually works. So the first thing that you need to understand is how a payment channel works. Let's pretend that a woman named Alice and a man named Bob are roommates. Alice and Bob are constantly sending money to one another in order to split mon monthly expenses like food, cleaning supplies, and bar tabs. So Alice and Bob are both cryptocurrency enthusiasts, so naturally, they use Bitcoin to pay one another. This arrangement worked great up until 2017 when Bitcoin's transaction fees started spiking. So what can be done about this? Well, instead of sending multiple transactions to one another throughout the month, what if Alice and Bob gave each other IOUs throughout the month and then settled the final balance at the end of the month using a single on-chain transaction? You know, this might make sense if we can ensure that nobody is able to cheat and that either party can redeem the IOUs at any time. So this is essentially what a payment channel accomplishes. So a payment channel allows two people to exchange a series of transactions without actually adding those transactions to the blockchain and thus not incurring any transaction fees. So these are called off-chain transactions because they are kept off the blockchain. So you can think of payment channel transactions similar to exchanging a series of IOUs with someone that will be settled at a later date. We use smart contracts to ensure that nobody is able to cheat. Now you may be thinking, I didn't know Bitcoin or Decred had smart contracts, and this is a common misconception, right? Bitcoin and Decred both have the ability to execute smart contracts, um, but they're not turning complete smart contracts like Ethereum, you know, but you don't need turning complete smart contracts to accomplish this, you know, lightning network behavior. So getting back to payment channels, Alice and Bob open up a payment channel by depositing one Bitcoin each into a, a multi-signature wallet, a common multi-signature wallet. And they do that using a normal on-chain transaction. So this is called a funding transaction, and this is how you open a payment channel. Now, anytime one of them needs to pay the other, they exchange a type of IOU called a commitment transaction. Commitment transactions don't get broadcast to the rest of the Bitcoin network, and they don't get added to the blockchain. So let's run through an example. You know, let's say Bob pays Alice 0.05 or 0 0.05 Bitcoin, right? So they, they both have a starting balance of one Bitcoin each and then Bob pays Alice 0 0.05 Bitcoin. To do this, they create a commitment transaction that reflects the new channel balance. So they both sign this commitment transaction. You know, since it's a multi-signature wallet, it requires both of their signatures to be a valid transaction. And then they exchange it and they both store a copy of it. So in this case, the commitment transaction stipulates 
send Alice 1.05 Bitcoin, send Bob 0.95 Bitcoin. So notice that the transaction amounts are for the current balance of the payment channel, not just the 0.05 Bitcoin that Bob is sending to Alice. So each new commitment transaction represents the most recent payment channel balance and it cancels out the previous commitment transaction. That that old, that old commitment channel tr uh, transaction reflects the old balance and so is no longer valid. So the commitment transaction is, it's a valid Bitcoin transaction that can be broadcast to the rest of the network at any time. So if Bob or Alice wanted to close the payment channel, they would simply broadcast the most recent commitment transaction to the rest of the Bitcoin network. And this would send the current balance that is owed to both Bob and Wallet to their respective wallets. So they don't broadcast the commitment transaction though. They decide to hold on to it, you know, thus keeping the payment channel open so that they continue to send new commitment transactions to one another throughout the month. So, you know, the month goes on and they send a total of 15 commitment transactions to one another, each transaction changing the ch uh, channel balance. At the end of the month, they decide to cash out and close the payment channel by broadcasting what's called a settlement transaction. A settlement transaction is a on-chain Bitcoin transaction that sends the final balance from the multi-signature wallet to Alice and Bob's personal wallets. This closes the payment channel. So to recap, Alice and Bob opened a payment channel with a funding transaction. This is an on-chain transaction that sends funds from both parties into a common multi-signature wallet. They then sent 15 commitment transactions to one another throughout the month. These are off-chain transactions that don't get broadcast to the rest of the Bitcoin network and don't get added to the blockchain. So Alice and Bob, you know, exchange these commitment transactions using a normal internet connection, just like sending an email to someone. Then they close the payment channel with a settlement transaction that reflected the final balance. The settlement transaction is a, again, an on-chain transaction uh, that sends the final balance from the multi-signature wallet to Alice and Bob's personal wallets. So this is how payment channels work. They're a way to compress a near infinite number of transactions into just two on-chain transactions, the funding transaction and the settlement transaction. So payment channels are a neat concept, but you know, how many people do you transact with frequently enough that it actually makes sense to open a payment channel with them? You know, a more practical technology is routed payment channels, AKA the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is a protocol that allows you to send payments through other people's payment channels. So let's say that Alice, Bob, and Carol all have Lightning nodes running. Alice has a payment channel open with Bob and Bob has a payment channel open with Carol. So without the Lightning Network, Alice has no way to send a payment to Carol without directly opening a payment channel with her. With the Lightning Network, Alice can send a payment to Carol by routing the payment through Bob. So the payment would move from Alice to Bob and then from Bob to Carol. And we're able to keep this process entirely trustless by once again using smart contracts. Now, you know, this is a pretty simple example with only one intermediate hop, but you can apply the same concept to payments that require lots of intermediate hops. And you can think of the Lightning Network as a network of Lightning nodes that are connected by payment channels. You know, this is similar to the concept of the internet itself. When you make a Google search, you're sending data from your computer to Google servers, but it makes several stops at computers in between called routers. And these routers serve as connecting hubs for the data as it moves to its destination. So this process is governed by a protocol called the Internet Protocol, or IP for short. You know, similar to how the Internet Protocol routes data packets to their destination, the Lightning Network is a protocol that routes payments to their destination. So if you think of the Lightning Network in the context of scaling a blockchain, you know, Elizabeth Stark, the CEO of Lightning Labs, used an analogy that a blockchain is like a highway. Sending an on-chain transaction is equivalent to a car driving down that highway, and when you have too many cars on the road, you get a traffic jam. You know, increasing the block size is like adding more lanes to the highway, whereas using the Lightning Network is like teleporting your car directly to its destination, right? It's an instant transaction. And so this sounds great, but nothing in life is free. So what trade-offs are we making in order, to get, in order to get this low fee instant confirmation transaction? Well, for one, your Lightning funds are being stored in a hot wallet. So a hot wallet is a wallet that's connected to the internet and hot wallets have larger attack surfaces than something like storing your cryptocurrency in cold storage. You know, so not only is your wallet connected to the internet, but you know, it's also running on hardware. That hardware could have vulnerabilities in it. The operating system that it's running on could have vulnerabilities in it. You know, so it, there, there are trade-offs. And so a second trade-off that you're making is that you're deferring transaction finality to a later date. 
So transaction finality means that, you know, once your transaction has been included in the blockchain, it is 100% irreversible. You know, the transaction is final. So when you send a lightning payment, you're deferring this transaction finality to a later date. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that lightning payments are reversible, but your transactions are not technically final until they've been recorded on the blockchain. So this is probably gonna be uh, an important stipulation in contract requirements. You know, if you're making a large purchase, like buying a house or a car, you don't wanna use an on-chain transaction. If you're buying something from Amazon, you know, using the Lightning Network is a perfectly reasonable way to pay. So far, our explanation of the Lightning Network has been entirely theoretical. So let's take a look at what the Lightning Network looks like in the real world. The image that you're seeing is a graph from the end of March that shows all of the Lightning Network nodes currently running on the Bitcoin mainnet. The lines connecting the nodes are the payment channel connections. So there's roughly 1,500 Lightning Network nodes currently running on Bitcoin mainnet with about 3,500 open payment channels. Running a Lightning Network node just means that you're running the Lightning Network software on your computer. You can connect your node to the rest of the network by either opening up payment channels manually, or you can use a nifty feature called Autopilot, which will automatically open up channels for you and manage the connections for you. Once you have channels opened up, you can start sending payments. So the first thing that happens when you send a payment is your Lightning node needs to figure out a route. You know, how does it get your payment to its destination? What other nodes does it need to route, does it need to route through? And it does this by looking at a network map of all the Lightning nodes that it knows about, and it uses that to calculate a route. So this route may be just two hops, or it may be 20 hops. You know, each time your payment moves through a different Lightning node, you'll need to pay a small fee to that node for allowing your payment to move through it. So the price of these fees are dictated by the market, but they should be extremely low because the barriers to entry to running a Lightning node are extremely low, which means that competition among nodes will drive the cost of fees down, and the fees should eventually trend towards the marginal cost of delivering the service, you know, which will probably be fractions of a penny. One important point about Lightning nodes is that when a payment is routed through a node, the value of that payment is temporarily locked up. You know, for example, let's say Alice is running a Lightning node and has funded it with one Bitcoin. If a payment of 0.5 Bitcoin is routed through Alice's node, Alice will have 0.5 of her Bitcoin temporarily locked up until the payment makes it to its final destination. You know, this is the smart contracts in action. So once the payment reaches its final destination, everyone's funds get unlocked um, and all the nodes that were part of that route get a small fee for the service they provided. So if Alice has one Bitcoin in her Lightning node, only payments of less than one Bitcoin will be able to be routed through her node. So now that you understand you know, the basics of the Lightning Network, let's dive into some specifics. You know, one of the most interesting features of the Lightning Network is a feature called onion routing. So onion routing is a technique for anonymous communication over a network, such as the Lightning Network, and was popularized originally by the Tor project. You know, in an onion network, messages are encapsulated in layers of encryption analogous to layers of an onion. So when a payment is moving through you know, various Lightning nodes, each node will only be able to see information about the immediate hop before it and the immediate hop after it. So as the payment moves across nodes, additional layers of routing information are revealed to the nodes, similar to how you peel away layers of an onion. So this means that a Lightning node, you know, it can't tell who the original sender of the payment was or where the payment will end up. You know, lightning routes can be up to 20 hops long and nodes have no idea how many hops the payment has already been through or how many hops it has left. You know, even if a payment only has one or a couple hops left, it'll be filled with fake data to make it appear as if it still has 20 hops left. You know, so lightning nodes have no idea where a payment originally came from, you know, where it's, where its final destination is or how many hops it has left until it reaches its final destination. So this dramatically increases the privacy and fungibility of cryptocurrencies, which we'll talk more about in episode three. There are also uh, some other techniques being developed in order to further increase the privacy of the Lightning Network. One such technique is topology randomization. This just means that when a Lightning node opens payment channels, it's going to do so in a, random in a random fashion to try and prevent centralized hubs from forming that can observe the traffic. So instead of you know, everyone just opening up a payment channel to Coinbase, the channels are going to be opened up completely randomly. You know, a second technique that's being used is called route randomization. So this is when your Lightning node will calculate multiple route options for getting your payment to its destination, and then it chooses one of those options at random so that routes don't become predictable. You know, so privacy is an extremely important feature to the Lightning Network developers. Onion routing, topology randomization, and route randomization uh, will go a long way in protecting users' privacy. 
One of the big concerns about the Lightning Network is that it's gonna become centralized. There's this narrative out there that the big banks have bought the Lightning Network and all hope is lost. You know, and that's just not true. So we're gonna examine some of these claims and see what's up. But before we do though, let's first talk about network architectures. The image that you're seeing shows the three main types of network architectures, centralized, decentralized, and distributed. In a centralized network, everything relies on a central hub. A decentralized network is akin to a hub and spoke model where you have nodes connected to centralized hubs with these centralized hubs connected to one another. And then a distributed network would be a mesh network of peer-to-peer -peer nodes. So distributed networks are also referred to as scale-free networks because they look the same at any scale. The internet is an example of a scale-free network. So the Lightning Network architecture that would facilitate the highest level of privacy and fungibility would be a distributed, distributed mesh network of peer-to-peer -peer nodes. A less optimal solution would be if Lightning nodes formed a hub and spoke style network with large institutions like cryptocurrency exchanges, Coinbase, online retailers, Amazon, big banks like JP Morgan, and government agencies, the NSA, serving as the centralized hubs. So we don't know exactly how the Lightning Network topology is gonna to evolve over time, but we can talk about some of the factors that will help shape it. So one of the main arguments that Lightning Network critics use is that someone running a Lightning node will be subject to AML, KYC, anti-money anti laundering regulations and would be required to attain a money transmission license. So if this indeed was true, it would be a huge blow to the Lightning Network and would surely lead to centralization of Lightning nodes. You know, only the companies willing to put up the financial backing required to jump through all the regulatory hurdles would be able to run li these Lightning nodes that have payments route through them. So lucky for us though, this doesn't seem to be the case. Coin Center, the Washington DC based nonprofit that educates you know, policymakers on cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology has taken the position that a lightning node cannot lose or run away with users money. As a result, lightning nodes present little to no risk to consumers, so should not require licensing. So this seems like a pretty common sense approach. Um, and you know, we can't be certain, but so far regulator, regulators have indicated that they have no plans to impose burdensome regulation that will damper innovation. You know, something like this would surely damper innovation. Another commonly heard argument is that central hubs will naturally form in order to provide the liquidity required for large payments to move across the network. So this stems from the fact that sending a large payment, let's say 10 Bitcoin, requires that each lightning node the payment passes through contains at least 10 Bitcoin. You know, remember in order for a payment to move through a lightning node, that the payment amount gets temporarily locked up in that node. You know, so the argument is that only large institutions will be able to provide the liquidity for large lightning payments, thus leading to centralized hubs. So there are a couple counter arguments to this claim. You know, like we talked about before, when you store funds in a Lightning node, you're storing them in a hot wallet. If, some, if centralized hubs did form, these hot wallets would become huge targets for hackers. You know, not only would it be risky for your company to run a large Lightning node, there's a good chance they wouldn't be allowed to legally. So companies usually have strict guidelines and requirements around using hot wallets. You know, for example, Coinbase's insurance policy requires that they never have more than 2% of customer funds online at any one time. You know, this is barely enough liquidity to service their normal exchange activities, hence why they always go down during times of high volatility, uh, let alone run a large lightning node. So a second counter argument is that the lightning network mo will most likely be used for small payments. You know, if you're sending a large amount of cryptocurrency, you're probably going to want to use an on-chain transaction for that. This means that lightning nodes won't necessarily need to have a large amount of liquidity in them in order to service the majority of payments moving across the network. You know, but what if you know people do want to send these large payments across the network? Well, you also have to consider the various technologies being developed that help prevent centralized hubs from forming, such as topology randomization. You know, remember this is when your Lightning node opens payment channels in a completely random fashion, thus making it difficult for central hubs to form. You know, another technology that's even cooler is atomic multipath payments. So let's say you need to send your friend a payment of one Bitcoin, and you currently have five different payment channels open each channel containing 0.3 Bitcoin. Cumulatively, you have enough Bitcoin to send to your friend, but you don't have enough Bitcoin in any single channel to send the payment. So atomic multipath payments allows you to make that one Bitcoin payment by combining the Bitcoin spread throughout your various channels. Without atomic multipath payments, you would need to have a single channel open that contains the full payment amount. So 
this would make it far more convenient for a user to have just one payment channel open with a big centralized hub, you know, like Coinbase, and then have that one payment channel contain all of your, your Bitcoin or your cryptocurrency or your Decred. You know, with atomic multi-path payments, the user no longer has to sacrifice convenience if their funds are spread across multiple channels. You know, it also means that if a large payment is being sent via the Lightning Network, it can be broken up among multiple routes. So if you're sending a 10 Bitcoin payment, you know, the nodes that the payment moves through won't necessarily need to have 10 Bitcoin in them because the payment can be broken up across these multiple routes and spread out. So when you combine all of these factors, low barriers to running a Lightning node, large hubs becoming targets for hackers, legal requirements of large institutions running hot wallets, most payments moving across the Lightning network will probably be small amounts, topology randomization and atomic multipath payments, I think you can make a pretty strong case that the Lightning network is going to evolve as a mesh network of peer-to-peer -peer nodes. I mean, you always have some nodes that are larger than their peers, but these large nodes won't be central points of failure like in a hub and spoke model. Okay, moving on. Another common question that comes up is how often we need to open and close a payment channel. So this is an area that we just can't be certain about because everything is still so new and we just don't know. But theoretically, there's no reason why payment channels can't stay open indefinitely. You know, there's nothing in the code that would force a payment channel to close as long as both parties still want to keep it open. So if you're going to keep a payment channel open indefinitely, you're going to need ways to refill that payment channel. And there's a couple methods and techniques that you can use to do that. You know, one such method is called splicing. So splicing allows you to directly add funds into a payment channel without having to first close that payment channel. It hasn't been implemented yet, but it's on the 2018 roadmap for Lightning Labs. Um, another way to refill your payment channel would be to have payments sent to you. You know, this could take the form of having your paycheck or part of your paycheck sent to your Lightning Node address, or you might purchase Bitcoin or Decred from an exchange and then withdraw that cryptocurrency using a Lightning Network payment. All right, all of this sounds great, but we haven't talked about the limitations of the Lightning Network yet, so let's do that. You know, one of the big hurdles that will need to be overcome is the fact that your Lightning Node needs to be online in order to send or receive payments. You know, this isn't that big of a deal for sending payments because you'll need to open up some kind of app to input the payment amount and destination anyway, um, thus bringing your Lightning Node online. But it might be a bit tricky if you want to receive payments during times of the day when you're not available, you know, like when you're sleeping. So not everyone is going to be able to run their own Lightning Node server, you know, that's available 24-7. This is in stark contrast to on-chain transactions where you can receive payments anytime, day or night, because those payments are being stored on a global distributed ledger, right? You're not the only person responsible for, for storing those on-chain payments. Um, so for Bitcoin and Decred, you know, you don't need to be online in order to receive a Bitcoin or Decred payment. You don't even need to have a node uh, in order to receive a Bitcoin or Decred payment. So, you know, this presents a challenge for Lightning Network adoption, but it's certainly something that be, can be overcome. Um, for example, Neutrino is an experimental light client that was designed with mobile Lightning Network clients in mind. So Neutrino will hopefully make it possible to send and receive payments by simply opening up a mobile app. Um, you know, this doesn't address the problem of receiving payments while you're sleeping, but it's a step in the right direction. Another solution that's being worked on is a device called Litbox. So Litbox is a project that the Vertcoin team is currently working on, and it's essentially a plug and play device that would act as your lightning node and stay online 24 seven. You know, you simply plug it into your router, connect to it with one of your devices and you're good to go. You know, Litbox also routes all of your traffic through Tor so that your, your home IP address can't be linked back to your on-chain wallet addresses. You know, sounds pretty cool. I'm excited to see where that one goes. Another big limitation that we haven't talked about yet is that it's actually possible to broadcast an old commitment transaction that reflects an old channel balance in an attempt to cheat someone that you have a payment channel open with. You know, in order to disincentivize this behavior, the Lightning Network has some game theory built into it. Um, you know, it couldn't be accomplished purely with smart contracts. So what they did is if you catch someone trying to cheat you, you not only get all of your cryptocurrency back, you get all of the attacker's cryptocurrency too as a punishment to the attacker. This, however, requires that you're constantly watching the blockchain for someone trying to cheat you, which probably isn't practical for most people. So to address this, the developers have created something called Watchtowers. A watchtower is a third party entity that monitors the blockchain 24 seven for you, making sure that nobody tries to cheat you. If they catch a cheater on your behalf, they get to, catch, they get to keep some of the cheater's cryptocurrency as payment um, that would normally go to you. 
So these are just some of the challenges facing the Lightning Network. I'm sure that there's more out there, but the main point is that all of these challenges can be overcome with a bit of ingenuity and engineering. You know, saying that the Lightning Network won't work because of these limitations would be like somebody in the 90s saying that video streaming will never work because it takes five minutes to download a JPEG. You know, these challenges are just bumps in the road on a very long journey to building a decentralized internet of payments. So we've talked a lot about the Lightning Network and how it applies to Bitcoin and Decred, but it also applies to any cryptocurrency that wants to implement their own Lightning Network. There are just three cryptographic primitives that are required. One, the cryptocurrency needs to have the ability to create multi-signature wallets. Um, they need to have the ability to apply a time lock to a transaction output, and they need to have the ability to redeem a transaction output using the pre-image of a hash. So if you don't know what these mean, don't worry. We'll talk more about them in a later episode that breaks down all the smart contracts that make the Lightning Network possible. Okay, the last topic we'll be covering is when will the Lightning Network be ready? Developers are already testing the Lightning Network on the Bitcoin mainnet, but Jameson Lopp said it the best in this tweet. The rollout has already begun. This is an iterative distributed learning process. It's unlikely there will be a single point in time at which we say the Lightning Network is deployed because it will grow organically. Software is never finished. You know, one thing is certain though, 2018 is gonna be an exciting year for the Lightning Network. Um, that wraps up this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Tune in next time for a look at what the Lightning Network means for the cryptocurrency ecosystem as a whole. We'll be covering topics ranging from scalability to privacy to interoperability and a concept called the ability to stream money. Thanks for joining us.